that he leaves them, best I could tell, with his uncle Samuel, uh, and he heads down to, uh, to Virginia. Um, you know, I, I'm a historian, I'm not a sort of moral critic of his life, but it, it fascinates me that in light of the fact that he had to tend and care for his family, he still takes the job at Virginia. Uh, it shows me the sort of drive and ambition that, you know, this is very much a sort of cosmopolitan world. He might as well have been going to London when he went to Virginia. People from South Jersey did not travel that much in, to Virginia in the 18th century, and they certainly didn't spend time on plantations. Uh, you know, so, so in many ways, this is a, a major experience for him on his, what I call in the title of the book, his way of improvement, of self-improvement, of ambition, of making something of himself. Many of you who've read the journal know the story of his experience with Carter. He's there for a year. I won't go into that here because I want to focus on some other things. Uh, but it's all there in the book. I talk about this. Uh, he returns home, of course, all the while. He's in this uh, rather torrid love affair with uh, Elizabeth Beatty, the daughter of uh, Charles Beatty, the minister, Presbyterian minister at the Neshaminy, Pennsylvania Church. Uh, I explore a large, you know, it, some of you may have read John Adams. It's, uh, Bi uh, David McCullough's biography of John Adams. And in that book, you get this wonderful relationship between John and Abigail, you know, the love affair between the two. Um, there aren't as many letters between Philip and Betsy as there were John and Abigail Adams. But um, the letters between Philip and Betsy are a lot juicier, let's put it that way, <laughs> in a sort of 18th century kind of way, juicier. Uh, it's, it's not an easy relationship. It's not, you know, you know, all roses, a bed of roses, their relationship. There's its ups, there's its down, there's a love triangle in there that I discovered uh, with a young man who I don't know anything about other than his name was Rodman, who had apparently won Betsy's heart while Philip was in Virginia. Philip schemes to try to break up their relationship, and from what I can tell, he's quite successful at doing so, because uh, he ends up eventually marrying Betsy. But I chronicle this whole story of their relationship uh, relationship there. Uh, Philip returns home in 1774 from Virginia. He spends, uh, this, this is when he uh, is involved in the Tea Party, or, or at least reports on the Tea Party uh, uh, happening. And then he eventually is going to take a uh, one year where he's going to travel and meet with uh, uh, Scots-Irish Presbyterians in the back country. Uh, the Susquehanna River Valley, he'll spend several months there. And then with Robert, uh, he's with Robert Hunter, I'm sorry, sorry, Andrew Hunter, his friend uh, from Greenwich, the son, the nephew of the, the minister of the Presbyterian Church in Greenwich. Uh, and then he goes into the Shenandoah River Valley to, to meet with the Scots-Irish down there as well uh, and minister there. He gets several job offers while he's in these regions, every one of them which, in which he turns down simply because... Uh, as I try to suggest in the book, he's in love with Betsy, number one, who wants to return to her. Uh, and number two, um, and I think more importantly, he's deeply connected to this, to this place. He's deeply connected to Cohansey. He's deeply connected to his home. And as much as he's sort of pursuing ambition, pursuing a life that's leading him away from home, an educated gentleman he's becoming, he still has these deep, deep affections. Uh, for at one point, he says, the very soil of the Cohansey, you know, of Cohansey. Uh, his family, his friends, his connections, which I explore in the sort of everyday life that goes on here in the book. So he's torn. He's, a, he's a, becoming a modern man, almost, who, who you know, gets educated, leaves home, but yet is 